Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. We need to roll back the state. We spy on all of our own citizens. Our prisons are flooded with nonviolent drug offenders. If you want to know who America's next enemy is, look at who we're funding right now. Every single one of these problems are a result of government being way too big. Everybody, welcome to a brand new episode of Part of the Problem. I'm very happy to be joined today by Nicole Shanahan, who I was able to uh, meet and we briefly uh, spoke at the Libertarian Party National Convention. She is a lawyer, a philanthropist, a businesswoman, and I'm sure, as you all know, is also an independent vice presidential candidate running with Bobby Kennedy, who's been on the show uh, several times. So thanks so much for joining us, Nicole. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, you know, I'm, I wanted to ask you because I've seen, you know, some reports in, in the press, uh, you know, since you've joined the ticket. Um, and it seemed I, I, I tend to not trust anything that I see in the, the corporate media these days. But I have heard people uh, talk about how you've kind of had a political evolution over the last few years, that you were more of a um, kind of standard uh, Democrat and have grown skeptical, perhaps, of some of the institutions in this country, which I I, I found that interesting because I think that mirrors a lot of people uh, mm-hmm. in, in America, that there's been kind of a realignment of how people see things in this country. So I was just curious to to get your thoughts on that or like what what is your experience been that led you to this place where you're now running for for vice president? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think that myself, like many Americans, feel incredibly disillusioned with what's happened to our government. And um, in spite of how big the government has grown, it is enormous. Um, it has failed to meet basic needs of the American family. And I think it's pretty broadly felt that there's a sense of incredible betrayal right now. Um, there's also this sense of a blaring lack of competency uh, to serve public office. And the use of the media to manipulate voters, um, the way politics has really belittled um, individuals who I believe, you know, we're one of the most incredible countries in the planet full of some of the smartest, most vigilant people. Um, And the way that the American public has been treated and spoken to, I've found to be incredibly insulting. Um, The way that I have been spoken to and was spoken to by my own party, the party that I had given so much to, told things that it were not only making no sense, um, but told things in a way that um, belied this hopelessness. And, you know, if anyone ever tells you something's impossible or it's unrealistic and what you're asking for is a basic human need, there's something wrong there and there's definitely corruption. So my experience um, in witnessing from the inside the corruption of the democratic elite um, was absolutely heartbreaking, infuriating, and there was no way that I could continue to stick by it. Um, I I didn't support Biden in the primaries in 2020. I actually um, was really excited by Marion Williamson maxed out on her campaign. Um, you know, and and Buttigieg, I wouldn't get behind him now, knowing what I know, but back then he was this young, fresh voice or he seemed to be a young fresh voice but but I never met with him in person Marianne I was much more excited about and it was during that 2020 primary that I realized how deeply broken the party had become that there actually wasn't really a DNC anymore it was a single dynastic lineage um, of these politicians and I can't even call them Democrats I, I call them almost puppets for some corporate elitism that's overtaken the party. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a 
objectively more accurate description than anything having to do with democracy. And in fact, you know, just the, the word Democrat is rooted in the, from the word democracy, and they seem quite hostile to that. Um, mm. So I think one of the things about um, Bobby Kennedy's presidential campaign that I've been struck by from the very beginning, and I've mentioned this several times on the show, but I think it's one of the most fascinating uh, things about his run, and there's several, um, is his focus on health. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this, look, I, I will confess, this is something I don't know a lot about and really never paid much attention to, but it is, you know, the, the topic of health never comes up. The topic of health insurance comes up sometimes in presidential Cost of campaigns. Drugs comes up a lot. Yes, right. Things like yeah. that. So there's, there'll, there'll always be a debate in the Democratic primary between whether you're for Medicare for all or you're for a public option or you're for Obamacare. Or you're for, you know, like what, whatever your insurance plan is. But Bobby, Ken here's Bobby Kennedy. And he's bringing up the fact that America um, leads the world in chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. And I must confess, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, I did not know that until he started bringing it up. And one of the dynamics that I've thought was kind of interesting is that he immediately gets smeared as a conspiracy theorist um, because he might point to certain culprits that I, you're not allowed to suggest are the culprits for, for the health crisis in America. But it's, it's hard if you're looking at things honestly to not say to yourself, well, I mean, nobody else is talking about this at all. So like, what is the reason why America is leading the world in chronic illness? What is what what does explain the explosion of autism and and type two diabetes in children and like all of these things? And it seems like the entire establishment media and the entire political class is quite happy to just not have this conversation. It's just not something you're supposed yeah. to talk about in politics. And and. So I guess, number one, it's just that's very bizarre. Like, that's a very bizarre thing that there's this huge crisis and no one else talks about it. I'm not saying no academics ever talk about it, but I mean, no one running for president aside from Bobby Kennedy talks about it. And it, it seems to me like this is one of the things that also kind of drew you to him, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. It's the number one thing that drew me to him. Um, I faced in my personal life, and I still do quite a bit of of gaslighting as it relates to pointing out the culprits. Um, it's it, it, trying to understand how we got to this position where the majority of our children are suffering from some kind of chronic illness. Um, doctors are more aligned with prescribing a certain set of medications than they are thinking broadly about healing um, an ailment. Um, doctors feeling like they're somehow beholden to insurance companies and beholden um, to the scientists that are funded by corporate dollars. Um, it, it, the layers and layers and layers of conflicts of interest run so deep. And it's created this trance almost in this country that has not allowed people to be able to voice their their pain of of not being able to overcome illness it's become accepted as normal um it's been accepted by so many people that you you just treat symptoms um and that the corruption runs so deep and is so powerful that we can't overcome it and there hasn't been a leader until Bobby Kennedy coming out onto the public stage that has taken all of the hits that he's taken to get this message across. Um, and he's speaking to something so deeply intrinsic within all of us, which is this belief that we are entitled to health, that it is a basic human right that um, we're able to consume food that doesn't poison us, um, that we have the ability to fully heal our immune systems without um, interventions telling us that we need to, quote, you know, take one to the for the team or virtue signal or take the risk. I mean, remember um, when people were lining up for the COVID-19 vaccines, there was mass fear that um, individuals could have 
incredibly dire responses. And people did it anyways, because they were made to believe that this was in the best interest of the country. I mean, that just goes to show how patriotic so many of us are in this country that, you know, 80% of it was willing to endure the risk because they believed it was an effective vaccine. Um, And they were willing to take, um, you know, the jab on behalf of their fellow Americans. And I think that that patriotism and that deep sense of of community um, responsibility was misused, abused, and manipulated. Um, It's one of the biggest slights upon, you know, the goodness of of the people in this country and the lack of accountability um, and and the lack of also acknowledging those people that did get really hurt. Um, We we don't hear the uh, outcry from politicians except for Bobby Kennedy um, because he understands that go that goes to the root and the soul um, of this country. And, you know, when you uh, treat the, the, the soul of this country, the way that so many of our leaders have over the last eight years, <laughs> um, you get to a place where, you know, I think both you and I have arrived to, which is just absolute fury and 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 real um and a real call to action for something different yeah 100 percent. and particularly when you're talking about the health of kids i mean just what could make you angrier than that when people are putting your you know your kids health in in jeopardy and uh, particularly you know like i just mm-hmm. t- debated uh chris cuomo the other day who was one of the chief you know um propagandists involved in in the whole yeah. response to COVID. And it's like remarkable. And it was just getting me so much more furious during it that it's like the guy knows nothing. It's like the guy who's like in a suit and tie on CNN and, and be, being looked to by people as like an expert in the news. That guy's just got none of the information. I mean, just still repeating stuff. He that's almost been came around, you know, he <laughs> almost came around about a month ago. And I was like, wow, Chris is going to call out the ineffectiveness and the dangers of the vaccine and how I've Mecton had had been um, right. completely misrepresented and continues to be um, regulated uh, a way for, you know, for what? We don't really know why ivermectin has been treated the way it has, likely because it has been so effective as an alternative treatment and in some ways even more effective than than the COVID-19 vaccine. Um but he almost came around and I was very optimistic. But then you wonder what happened between, you know, the day he came out and he was going to do the right thing and then where he is right now, which is kind of doubling down on what he did before. Well, it certainly seems that he was indicating that he f- faced a lot of backlash, let's say, from that. And I don't mean backlash from like the people, but backlash from you know people in his old world. And it, it seems to me like he's trying to make sure he doesn't you know, completely close the door on ever being able to get back into that that world. But that's just, that's just my read on it. It seemed to be what he was indicating. But it is you're you're absolutely right that there's tremendous anger over a lot of these things in the country, and and really, you know, justifiably so. They the you know one of the things we when I did this debate with Chris, one of the things that they were playing, and I'd kind of forgotten about this, but it was uh, just one of the great moments in the COVID insanity. But do you remember the video of a uh, Fauci going into like the inner city in Baltimore and just getting shut down by yeah. person after person? But the crazy thing about it is they're like, yeah. they're bringing this kind of educational campaign to the inner city of Baltimore. Like let's go into the hood and tell these black people about how they got to get vaccinated. And then they're getting into these arguments and the random people's doors they knocked on are destroying Fauci. Like not even just like that they're arguing with him. They're, with the benefit of time now, we're objectively correct while the head of the NIH is lying through his teeth, is saying you can't transmit the virus if you get the vaccine and you're never going to even get the virus if you have the vaccine. And even if you do, you won't even know you have it because you won't be sick. I mean, I don't know. I, I know personally a ton of people who got the vaccine and then got very sick from COVID. And it's just like, oh, yeah, you were wrong. And this guy was totally right. It was really just amazing. Well, and and that's why I'm optimistic in this moment is that the intelligence um, 
of the average American, e- even if they have been in- disenfranchised, they don't capitulate um, to what they view to be a corrupt system. And the majority of this country is is on it. They're they're not missing a beat right now. Um, and the propaganda that once really worked is no longer working. So they really got so much of this wrong um, over the pandemic and they pulled out all the stops. Um, and, and I don't think it is going to go well for them in this election as a result of that. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is My Patriot Supply. Another day, there's another breaking news story, there's another distraction. If you're anything like me over the last few years, the last four years particularly, you've become a little bit concerned about what the future might hold. There's a lot of uncertainty out there, and it's always better to be prepared than to be unprepared. And that's where My Patriot Supply comes in. Prepare for whatever's next with My Patriot Supply. Since 2008, they have been helping millions of Americans get ready for the worst. And right now, it is the final week to save $200 off of their best-selling three-month emergency food kits that are flying off the shelves. Get yours right now at my website, preparewithsmith.com. The food kit offers over 2,000 calories every day, plus with ultra-durable four-layer packaging, it lasts up to 25 Five years in storage. Order all the food kits you need for $200 off each, plus free shipping, but only during the final week of this offer. You've been warned about what can happen. Don't live in fear. Take back control of your future because it isn't just food, it's freedom. Stock up on these food kits at preparewithsmith.com before time runs out to save. Go to preparewithsmith.com. All right, let's get back into the show. One of the things that confuses me, and I'd love to get your take on this, is why there's kind of this mass amnesia um, about the fact that Trump was the one um, who stood behind Fauci, um, put tens of billions of dollars into Project Warp Speed and wasn't really listening to um, opposing viewpoints. I mean, he really did, you know, set up um, Fauci and and everyone at NIH to lead this thing nearly blindly from the executive office um, position of responsibility that he held in that moment. You know, it's a I don't know that I'm going to have a great answer for you on why it is. Uh, obviously part of it is just partisanship. Uh, Part of it is that Trump's followers really do feel like he is their last heroic hope or something like that. But I've debated, um, a couple people on this topic over the last few years and even broader than COVID just kind of in general, Trump's failings on his appointments and policies that were explicitly, uh, 180 degrees from what he ran on. And the Mm -hmm. crazy thing about it to me is that Almost always, if I'm talking to a Trump supporter and if I were to say, hey, the lockdowns were terrible and totally like a crime against the American people and didn't even do anything to mitigate the virus, but ruined millions of people's lives. They're like, yes, absolutely. And I go, Fauci is totally corrupt. And uh, yes, absolutely. And, you know, the, the vaccine is totally not what they sold it as. Yes, absolutely. It's like they agree on all of the, the positions. Yeah. But then if I go, well, OK. You know, Donald Trump was the he's the guy who passed uh, the the national emergency that gave cover for all of the lockdown governors. He praised lockdowns. He was demonizing Sweden into the summer of yeah. 2020 for not locking down aggressively, um, celebrated the vaccine, still claims it saves hundreds of millions of lives on this, this ridiculous, dubious claim. And and. Even when I point out other things unrelated to COVID, like how is Mike Pence his vice president and Ray is his FBI director and John Bolton was his national security advisor. And the defense secretary was a Raytheon lobbyist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just the whole list is just awful. And at every single turn, Trump supporters will say, well, he got tricked and he didn't know who he could trust then, but he knows now. And and it's just kind of excuse after excuse. And my thing is always like, well, listen, you either get to say that this guy's the greatest leader, the greatest president, or you can say he gets tricked at every single turn, but it can't be both of those things. So I do not know why Donald Trump gets um, such a free pass from Trump supporters on his horrific record, not just on COVID, on war, on government spending, on, on a lot of different issues. 
I don't know why he gets it, but he sure does not deserve it. Agreed. Agreed. And um, and he's really never taken the hits at the moment where it counts. I mean, and I look at Bobby Kennedy and he took every hit at the moment it counted and he still is taking those hits when it counts the most. Um, so I, I, you know, from the perspective of somebody who has left one party and could not find myself swinging to support Trump um, and also looking at the data that Bobby Kennedy can win this race, it it was the only thing that made total sense was to put everything I had behind this independent race um, of his um, and, you know, chart a path towards success. I think it's the only way that I think we can put a pause on the corporate corruption in this country. Um, it's the only thing that can return sanity. Um, and, you know, his track record is so damn good. I mean, just if you look at the books he was writing when nobody was paying attention to him and everybody was condemning him as a conspiracy theorist, it turns out fact after fact in, in these books is turning out to be absolutely true um, and true at a time in which these investigations are just kind of putzing along. I mean, this was our first really big testimony and hearing with Fauci was was just this, you know, this last week. Um, so we're just at the beginning. We're at the tip of the iceberg and understanding how deep this runs and, and how correct Bobby was throughout this entire period. Yeah, look, there's no question that one of the most compelling things about uh, Bobby as a person and a political figure is that, look, the guy was born into the closest thing we have to a royal family in the United States of America. He's had a very privileged, uh, cushy, I mean, I wouldn't say cushy, like he's had, he's had a very privileged life. Obviously, there's been a lot of tragedy um, in his in his family. And obviously, he's dealt with, you know, and he's been very open about dealing with, um, you know, his health issues, his substance issues and all stuff like that. So I don't mean it's uh, cushy probably is the wrong word. But the guy certainly kind of in some sense had it made and has risked that standing in, you know, polite society has risked alienating family members and certainly alienating. I mean, the guy's in he's a Kennedy who's married to like a famous beloved actress. He could be at every party in Hollywood. He could be in, you know what I mean? Like all the fancy, you know, uh, places. Yeah. And he's he's stood up for what he believes and in large part faced a lot of pretty vicious backlash in those circles. So there, I think there's certainly something commendable about that, that clearly he really believes this stuff because it would be much easier for him personally to just shut up and not say anything about vaccines and continue to, you know, whatever, be in the, in, a, in that world. That's something that I very much admire about him. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. It's incredibly commendable. Um, and I would say for all of the people that have risked their careers, it, it's not just Bobby Kennedy. I've met countless doctors now that have been, um, you know, put into the incredible scrutiny, um, publicly harassed, publicly threatened, their licenses revoked. They've been deplatformed in silence numerous times. There's a lot of heroes out there right now that have risked it all. Many of them are in Geneva right now, standing outside of the WHO, yelling at the top of their lungs um, against, you know, this massive international treaty that the WHO is trying to pass that would require states um, to follow very, very strict rules during the event of a pandemic, um, exclusively defined um, by those individuals sitting in that room um, in Geneva. And so I think that it is um, incredibly imperative that all of us right now understand the significance of the whistleblowers um, in this moment and, and not turn away from the significance of of the war that is underhand, which is this war for sovereignty, this war for for health, um, this war for competency and real science. Um, mostly, it's also this war for freedom of speech. And it, it is fundamental that America be a leader in this moment um, and not capitulate uh, to the learnings um, that you know, we have it right in front of us, these learnings that there is a agenda at play um, to limit these freedoms. 
Yeah, no question. And I think that was, uh, you know, it's funny because even like I think saying things like this have a, you know, it's it's the, the people in the corporate media will say, well, this is conspiracy theory talk or whatever, which is what the, the term that they love to slap on on people like Bobby and yourself that, you know, j- just dismiss it because I called you this term. But after COVID, I mean, it's I just don't understand how anybody could deny that clearly there is an agenda at play and clearly they're willing to do the wrong thing by a lot of people's health in order to enact this agenda. And the lack of competency. I mean, take conspiracy out of it. You know, sure. I, I we don't know what the motive ultimately is of these individuals, but we know what the effect of it is, which is a lack of competency in handling these issues and a lack of ability to competently look at evidence-based solutions. Um, there is also, I think, what makes us feel that there is you know, a bad actor motive behind this um, is the outright lies. And and that's when, you know, you start to wonder why would someone knowingly misrepresent information? Yeah. Um, it, 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 it makes it makes this idea that there was an active um, attempt to conspire, um, you know, at, at this massive global agenda level, more realistic. Um, because why would so many people buy into the same lie over and over again? Yeah. And, well, it's, and, it's both, and even right? after so much has been proven um, yeah. and, and can be argued that that these actually are misre- misrepresentations. Yeah, no, 100 percent. I mean, I remember um, I've, I've told this story before on, on the show, but it's just to me really was one of the eye opening things about the the COVID era, because I like I, I've been a radical libertarian for many years at this point. So I was well aware of like government corruption and things like this way before COVID. And if you had asked me about the corruption in the NIH or in the CDC or anything like that, I would have I would have known about all of that. What really I, I did not appreciate until COVID was how much of a grip th- this corruption had on the entire medical field mm-hmm. and how much you're at your doctor it, while not being like a participant in any conspiracy could be totally wrapped up in this and so my it was my son um was about 6 months old and our pediatrician at the time who was no longer my pediatrician um he recommended to me and my wife that we give him the COVID vaccine. And my son um, had a very serious heart condition. He had open heart surgery when he was three days old. Wow. Um, he had transposition of the great arteries, if anybody, which, you know, I didn't know anything about uh, heart defects and before that, but I know a whole lot about it now because that's what happens when your kid has uh, an illness. But, you know, this is my, my six month old who is only six months removed from having open heart surgery. Wow. And they're recommending he take this COVID uh, vaccine, which I knew a thing or two about because I do a show about this stuff. And so I just start arguing with the doctor and it becomes very clear immediately. He doesn't know anything. I just doesn't know anything about it. He's re- he's recommending a medical intervention on a six month old who's had open heart surgery and knows nothing. I mean, like, no, literally knows nothing. I'm just off a quick mm-hmm. conversation. We're arguing and I'm just wrecking him in this argument. And then, of course, he's making a bunch of claims that later turned out to be completely wrong. And I already knew we're wrong at the time. And uh, so anyway, so I was like, no, we're not doing that. Sorry. And then my wife brought my son back like a month later for some other unrelated issue. And he started working on her. Wow. To, to give him That's the vaccine. Like when I wasn't there, I mean, I literally, I mean, I had to, it, <laughs> it took all of my willpower. I mean, I wanted to go there and like beat the crap out of the guy. I was, I was like so appalled that he, luckily for me, my wife's no pushover. My wife's, she's Italian. She's probably tougher than I am, but uh, so it wasn't going to happen anyway. But like the idea that the guy would then behind my back after we had argued about this, try to like put pressure on my wife to do it when I wasn't there just was so infuriated. Anyway, we left him and he, we have a much better pediatrician now, but it was a very eye opening thing to be like, okay, there's like different levels of it. We're like, okay, at, at the top, there's people who are making a lot of money and are very corrupt, but then just like the whole system of medicine could be so, well, they you get know, paid corrupted massive bonuses. I just learned right. from one doctor who's treated now thousands of COVID patients with ivermectin that had she given um, the Moderna 
vaccine to just the same number of patients. I, th- I think it was like 6,000 patients uh, that she would have received $1.5 million in bonuses from Anthem. So there's an ongoing incentive structure that really does reward doctors for um, prescribing these, you know, top medications and and they're actively being sold almost daily um, by these organizations and by health policy officials. Um, so if you're a doctor today, you're not really getting good information. You're getting highly conflicted information from every touch point between um, you and the infrastructure that allows you to provide care. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is Moink. I love this company so much. You guys got to check them out. Moink delivers grass fed and grass finished beef, lamb, pasteurized pork, chicken, sustainable wild caught Alaskan salmon, all straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did. And as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should because the family farm does it better. I don't know about you guys, but I know I do not trust the stuff in the soup supermarket. I don't trust buying meat there. Even when they say it's, it's, you know, grass fed and grass finished. I don't know if I trust this. I've heard all types of things about how people work that system. That's why you got to go to Moink, buy from family farms directly that, you know, you can trust them. You know, you're getting the stuff you're supposed to, and you choose the meat delivered in every box. So you can choose from ribeyes, chicken breasts, pork chops, salmon fillets, and much, much more. Plus you can cancel anytime. So keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash P-O-T-P right now. And listeners of this show get two free steaks in your first box. How about that? Two delicious free steaks that you will love just for signing up at moinkbox.com slash P-O-T-P. That's M-O-I-N-K-B-O-X dot com slash P-O-T-P. Go get those two free steaks right now. All right. Let's get back into the show. Uh, a good friend of mine, um, Tom Woods, who uh, he's had uh, Bobby on his show uh, uh, before also. And he he wrote this fantastic book about uh, COVID called Diary of a Psychosis, which I uh, gifted <laughs> to Chris Cuomo uh, the other day. Um, I could have given him a, a Bobby Kennedy uh, book also. I could have given him the real Anthony Fauci. That would, would have been good, too. But uh, but this was more specifically just about yeah. COVID. Um, but you know, he talked about, he has a newsletter and I remember he wrote about this and I thought this perfectly encapsulated like where a lot of us are. Um, People like me who, you know, was very interested in politics, but didn't really have any type of strong opinion on say vaccines or something like that before COVID. I, I largely dismissed people who argued that there was a a link between the MMR and autism or stuff like that. Like I just, I don't know. I was just, you know, I just didn't really know that much about it. And I'm like, from what I understand, the studies have said that's not true. And only Jenny mm-hmm. McCarthy believes that. So why should I take that seriously? You know? Yeah, but, exactly. So, right. So, so Tom was writing, um, in, in his newsletter and he told this story about, so he goes, uh, whatever he's like in his fifties or something like that. So he goes to his doctor and the doctor was like, Oh, you, uh, you know, you qualify for the shingles, uh, vaccine and blah, 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 whatever. You should take it because you don't want to get shingles or whatever. And he goes, uh, it's 94% effective or something like that. And Tom was writing in his newsletter and he goes, listen, any time before the last four years, I just would have been like, okay, yeah, I mean, you're the doctor. And so if you say I should take this shot, then put the shot in me. I don't know. I mean, 94% effective. That sounds pretty good. He goes, but after the last four years, you're like, wait a minute. I know about how you get these numbers, like where there's like the Pfizer study where like one person died of COVID in the vaccine group and two people died of COVID in the non-vaccine group. And so they go a hundred percent effective, but you know, and you're like, wait, no. And so now he's like, and now for the first time ever, I have to be like, no, don't give me that. I now have to go home and research this and decide whether or not I actually want to do this. And I guess I think that represents where I am too. And where a lot of people are is that you're like, Hey, if you guys got this one completely wrong, what else have you gotten wrong? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And and if you look how much money is spent into discrediting other opinions, I think that's really telling as well. Um, yeah. A really good scientist will double down on defending their position and really expand their scientific inquiry. Whereas someone who's trying to usually represent a corporate interest will use their money 
to attack the methodology of every other scientist around them or anyone who's trying to to propose alternative solutions. Um, no good scientist spends all of their time discrediting other scientists. Right. And, and that's just that's not the scientific method. The scientific method is is really expounding findings um, around your thesis and also trying to disprove um, weaknesses in your own uh, approaches and methods. Um, so there's there's something very much broken in the way the scientific method has been treated um, in this country, um, especially by uh, drug manufacturers. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of the issues that um, that you know, Bobby's brought up on the campaign that you're bringing up here now are just so it, it's, they're so, um, basic. They're so common and, sense and, and irrefutable. Irrefutable. Like yes. who, who could really argue? Yeah. Who could argue that yeah. pharmaceutical companies shouldn't get liability protections? Like what? Why should they? Why should they? If literally, if somebody, uh, like if somebody comes and breaks their neck, um, on my property because like I didn't, you know, like re repave my driveway or something like that. I'm on the hook. I don't get off for that. None of us get, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. That's, and, and why should I, like, I just, mm -hmm. it's, and then the, the other one that I've, I've heard Bobby talk about that you were, you were uh, talking about just now is that, yeah, but like if doctors are getting paid by, you know, by pharmaceutical companies, they should have to disclose that. Their patients have a right to know that. Like, you know, informed consent should include a thorough conflicts of interest disclosure. Um, because we know in every single uh, profession, there is this idea that conflicts of interest change the way you're able to effectively deliver um, professional services to your clients. And the lack of conflicts of interest disclosures writ large um, is is really why we're in such a dire situation because it's been normalized that that degree of influence um, is okay and and no big deal um, and and the way that they push that narrative forward um, is well you know it, it it's good enough and and there were rat studies and the rat studies were good and you know. Oral Valtrex never got tested on pregnant women, but I've never personally seen an issue. Um, and, and, and But the rat studies were good. And so the, we are gambling with people's lives in ways that's been um, normalized and, and belittled. Um, we need a voice that says, you know, gambling with lives in the way that the medical industry has is not okay. Um, yeah. And and should never be uh, minimized in, in the sense of, well, statistically, it's just so minor. Um, you know, if you look at any other products liability, it's taken incredibly seriously if there are deaths. Just a handful of deaths are taken very, very seriously by car manufacturers, crib manufacturers, um, you know, cleaning, cleaning supplies, household items, uh, baby wipes, baby powders. Yeah. I mean, why is it that the, um, medical manufacturers don't look at the world the same way? And, and I think that just goes to show how long this corruption has been going as well. Yeah, it's such a good point. Even as you say it, I'm like kind of thinking about it because I was thinking, I was literally just talking to my wife about this the other day where I was going, isn't it? It's kind of wild that like we we grew up at a time where there just weren't uh, car seats. You know what I mean? Like, I just remember being I remember that I, too. I remember being a little kid and just being in the car like my yeah. my daughter's five and she's still in one of those car seats. You know what I mean? And I, re I remember being five so well. And it was just, we didn't even have the shoulder uh, strap in the back seat. It was just like just the little trap. thing around your waist, which was just <laughs> not going to protect you in the event of a bad accident. But mm -hmm. we're so um, obsessed with uh, safety in so many ways now, particularly with kids, which, you know, I, I think is good. I'd rather my daughter be in that, you know, strapped into that car seat than just with a little thing around her, her belt. Um, and at the same time, as, as we care so much about like kind of protecting people, there has been number one, as you pointed out, there's this enormous corruption, but also as part of that, there seems to be, we're just so unhealthy 
as a society. Mm -hmm. And it's unbelievable that you kind of, um, you know, yeah, like, like I travel the country a lot and I'm, I'm from New York city. I, I just before I moved during COVID, but I used to live on the upper West side, a very like affluent progressive area. Um, and everyone's really into health there. But when you travel the country and you go around it, it's just this whole country is nothing but like Arby's and McDonald's and very, very overweight people. And yeah. it is it is wild that you have this whole industry of health care and that the topic of health care is debated. As I said earlier, the parameters of like, do you support Obamacare or Bernie Sanders, Medicare for all or whatever? But no one ever seems to like mention that there's something like 70 percent of the uh, medical costs in this country are associated with preventative illness. And it's like, we went to war with smoking. We've gotten rid of smoking in this country. Uh, you walk down the street, nobody smokes cigarettes anymore, but we're less healthy than we were when the country was smoking. It's really wild. It's it's true. And, and Ozempic is being marketed as this cure all. Yeah. Um, I recently read an article that says it actually has been proven um, it might be a fertility treatment as well. And I've just been watching the marketing around it. It is so uh, embarrassing to read, um, quite frankly, that, you know, if I was a European coming to America, reading an article about how this stomach paralysis drug is saving Americans from th themselves, <laughs> yeah. I would just be so confused and also quite critical of what's going on in this country. Um, meanwhile, you fly over the United States. We have all of this farmland that's being used suboptimally, sub suboptimally, um, 900 million acres of American farmland right now is sitting there with such incredible potential and no one's talking about it. Nobody's talking about how we turn those 900 million acres into a massive carbon sink, how we restore our aquifers with it. Um, um, we can solve most of our emissions issues through, you know, thinking differently about how we invest in American farmland. And 100 percent, we can solve most of these chronic chronic illnesses um, with improving our soil quality as well as the output from that soil. There's no excuse for individuals suffering from um, diabetes because they can't access healthy food in this country. We literally, it's its not like we're Singapore where we have uh, a, you know, limited amount of land. We have massive capacity to produce enormous amount of nutrition that we know heals bodies. Yeah. Well, look, I, Look, I'll say this, and I just I know this from personal experience or not personal experience, my wife's experience, but my personal experience of being around my wife, who I know pretty well. Um, and she my wife has a severe uh, gluten intolerance and she glyphosate. cannot. She, huh? It's it's likely due to glyphosate. Right. Allergy. Because it, it is. No, she got blood work done and she's not allergic to gluten, but she can't eat gluten in the United States of America. But when she goes to Italy she could eat all the gluten she wants and it just doesn't mess. And it's not like I'm telling you, like, it's not like she's like acting. I mean, it wipes her out if she mm -hmm. has it here, she's a mess. And it's, she could just go over there in Italy and eat all the bread and, and pasta she wants to. And it's like, Oh yeah. Our food in this country became poison with, with, without the knowledge of the American people, like the, the, from my grandmother's generation, like in my grandmother's time, having a slice of bread, you were having like wheat, flour, yeast, whatever, Water. you know, yeah, yeah what well, the ingredients in bread. Yeah. And then to my generation, having a slice of bread that you bought from the supermarket, you're having like 67,000 bromate, yes, which is like yes. a dough softener. Um, yeah. You're probably having residue pesticides numbering over two dozen. It's... Um, it's really devastating to see our country um, compliant in the mass poisoning of its population. Yeah. And against and without the forget even against their will, without even the knowledge of it, because I, I really mm -hmm. do think for the most part that Americans were completely unaware that they weren't still just eating a slice of bread. They were completely yeah. unaware that this had this had changed and nobody seemed um in, until this campaign, I really don't think there's ever been a presidential 
campaign who even brought this up. And, you know, it's one of the things like that, that I've found again, as I've said, I've just, mm -hmm. I, I've learned a little bit more about this uh, over this year. Um, but it's something that I must embarrassingly plead that I really just was very ignorant about. But one of the things that I've found the most fascinating in the response to Bobby's campaign is that it's like, so everyone's like, oh my God, he's such a kook because he blames these things that you're not allowed to blame. This is a dangerous conspiracy theory. And it's just like, okay, so what, what's your answer? Mm -hmm. So like, why, what's your answer for the explosion in autism rates? What's your answer for the fact that we lead the world in chronic illness? Like, what is it? If he's wrong about it, so what is it? And they're, they're not even offering an alternative. They're just like, no, you're not allowed to talk about this. I, I find that really confusing and almost um, cannibalistic. It, it, it's the number one issue of our time. And, you know, I assume we're roughly the same age. You're in your 40s. I'm 41. You're yeah. 41. Yeah, I'm turning 39. We have young kids. Um, this is the number one issue for people our age right now, young parents um, waking up and understanding that we growing up in the 90s were really the first generation to eat processed foods as if it was um, you know, food. <laughs> it's processed yeah. food is not food. Processed food is full of things that are not designed to be ingested um, and that our ancestors um, were not eating and our bodies are not situated to digest and metabolize correctly. We are facing a metabolic health crisis right now. And it's because of um, the poisons in our environment and our food systems. And the, you know, the fact that this is not the biggest campaign topic um, for either Trump or Biden is disgusting to me <laughs> as a mom, as a young mom, as a young parent, as somebody who is fully appreciating what's happening to what's happened to my generation and that um, we are, you know, passing weakened metabolic profiles to our children. Um because it's hereditary. So I, I really worry for um, the state of this country if we're not able to make this a priority in this moment. We have every opportunity right now to do so. Um, even here in California, we've refilled, you know, we've had great couple years of rain. There's no reason any farm should be cut cut off from water if they're engaging in regenerative practices in the state of California right now. And um, there's talk right now at the state level of shutting down water um, and laying a million acres of farmland fallow, which would be it, 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 it makes no sense. It is um, <laughs> It just none of it makes any sense to me. And 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 you would m like take off the table so much food um, from the state. California is a breadbasket of the rest of the country. And it begs the question, what the hell is going on with the leadership in the state that they think that taking a million acres of food land all, literally off the table um, in this country is good for this country? Um, it's terrible. And meanwhile, there's a massive push for um, lab grown foods, foods that are created in vat containers that have massive inputs and massive environmental footprints. Um, and they have excess waste that then just goes into landfills. Um, so I, I really, really question the integrity right now of many of our government leaders. Um, anyone who's not pointing out the ridiculousness and, and the heartlessness of taking away real food from people so that they can heal their immune systems, their bodies, their GIs. Um, it is the number one path towards health. It's been proven time and time again. And um, inaction in this moment is, in my opinion, treason. Yeah.
No, I think that's really well said. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is Oxygen Health Systems. Everybody is talking about these hyperbaric oxygen chambers. The benefits include a boost in energy level, decreased inflammation, anti-aging benefits, memory improvement, and overall brain function improvement, increased melatonin for better sleep. Now, owning a home hyperbaric chamber from Oxygen Health Systems is within your reach. And Oxygen Health Systems chambers integrate progressively advanced technology with amazing new features and they fit comfortably in your home the lux air hyperbaric chamber from oxygen health systems is unique in the industry and considered the tesla of portable hyperbaric chambers take advantage of the 500 savings off the lux air hyperbaric chamber today at oxygenhealthsystems.com make sure to use the coupon code problem at checkout that's oxygenhealthsystems.com Coupon code problem at checkout for $500 off the Lux Air Hyperbaric Chamber today. All right, let's get back into the show. I like the the kind of generational point that you made there too. You know, I talk sometimes to my uh, my in-laws about this. And, you know, when you talk to so my, uh, like, my, my, my mother, my, my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, they're all like uh, in their 70s. Um, or my mother's in her late 60s. They're, they're in their early 70s. And you, you know, one of the things that's interesting, they're only one generation removed, like their parents' generation were like to them, it was like, if you eat, like you're not leaving this table until you finish your food because they came from like, it's, you know, countries where it was like, oh, like we know about not having food. So if you yeah. have food, you eat. And that it almost like I feel bad for them in a way. I think they got somewhat duped because they just took that attitude is like, Hey, you got food, then that's not a problem you have. And I think us, as you pointed out, as young parents, um, we are the ones who are the first generation that kind of has to grapple with this, this new reality. And, and look, you're right. I mean, who could argue with that? You're talking about the health of our children. There's, I don't care what other issue you put up. Nothing's more important than that. Nothing's more important. <laughs> that's that's going to take number one. Mm -hmm. I don't care what other, you know, whatever I, I might think I pay a little bit too much in taxes, but my, my, the health of my kids is a lot more important than that. Um, and, it's one and so thing well if you're said. paying a lot of taxes and it's producing clean water and clean food and clean air and peace in the world. Yes. I would be willing to pay taxes if that was the exchange. But right now we are getting a bad trade on, yes, I ju on yes. all of those levels. I would. You wouldn't have to force me at the threat of imprisonment if I thought it was helping our country. Um, I'd be quite happy to pay something to help our country. Um, I don't uh, care to pay to fight um, proxy wars around the world that have nothing to do with us when we could uh, be using that money for much better purposes. All right. I know. Uh, your team has told us that uh, you had uh, an out here. So um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Likewise. I was planning uh, I was planning on asking you about uh, more about wars and stuff, but maybe next time we'll do that. But thank you so much, Nicole. And if yeah. people want to support you and Bobby Kennedy, where can they, where's the best place to go? Well, teamkennedy.com um, is a great place to, to look at all of our policy positions. And of course, on X, the um, one place where we're not being censored online. You can find just about everything. And there's a great website um, by one of our supporters, Anna, called KennedyDebunk.com, where she goes through each of the biggest misrepresentations that have been widely published by legacy media, and she debunks them one by one. And she's done an incredible job with that. That's great. That's a, that, that's a great idea. I'm glad she did that. All right. Well, I, I wish you guys the best of luck. And and regardless of what happens in uh, in this campaign, I do think the issues that that we've been talking about here are much bigger than any one campaign or much bigger than any one politician. These are really the this is going to be so important for us as a nation to to deal with this stuff going forward, because it yeah. is it's a new reality that our parents and grandparents didn't have to deal with. Yeah, hundred percent. And, you know, I, I'd love to sit down with you again, Dave. Um, I know we didn't cover a lot of the topics that we wanted to cover. And I, I just wanted to say personally, I, I do align with you on a lot of your positions in terms of foreign policy. And, uh, and, I, and I do think there is a general correlation between that generational correlation. Sure. Yeah, no, I'm sure I'd, I'd really love to do this again. Thank you so much okay. uh, for joining Thank us. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch Take you guys care. next time.